Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, praise you this morning and this evening in the U.S. for your grace and for your love. We want to exalt your name. Your name is above every name, the name of your son. We want to, to glorify you as we study your word, Father. As we, as we look at Revelation chapter 2, may we see the glory of Christ. May we also see his sovereignty and that he is over the churches and that uh, we are not bodies unto ourselves, but we, we are under authority. Help us to have uh, a balance between assurance and yet fear, not fear of falling into to judgment, but fear of not obeying the commands of of uh, Jesus, our Lord. Father, I pray that you would most importantly give us this vision to desire and look forward to uh, paradise, uh, the garden of God, and that we would, we would seek that, that future. I pray that we would conquer as we're called to do. In Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen. Okay, so welcome to chapter two. We made it to chapter two, and I actually have a short PowerPoint to share with us. If you will, turn in your Bibles to, uh, to Revelation chapter two. We're going to read Revelation chapter two, verses one to seven. Actually, before the PowerPoint, I am going to read the text for us to situate it, and then I'm going to, then we're going to discuss. So just bear with me one second here. Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Okay, so uh, as we contemplate these verses, to be sobering maybe encouraging. So what I want to do really quick before we discuss the text, I just want to give a, a brief PowerPoint to give us the original context of the church of Ephesus. So we have the, 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 the letters being written to the church of Ephesus. So I just want to really quick share with you a quick PowerPoint just to orient us, to save time as well, to orient us to um, the background context Okay, so this is just a short PowerPoint introdu introducing us to the Church of Ephesus. So it's going to go rather quick. I'll just briefly talk through these points to, to familiarize ourselves. No doubt all of us are familiar with the Church of Ephesus, but just some, some big historical facts to really help us. Um, so we're looking at Revelation 2, 1 to 7, and specifically the letter to Ephesus. And so just first, several background facts to the city of Ephesus, okay? So this is one of the first and greatest metropolises in Asia, so uh, especially Asia Minor, so within, which is now present-day Turkey. So if you're looking on a map present-day, this would be in Asia Minor. Uh, it was a very important commercial and exporting center in Asia. So this is not a small city. This is not an insignificant city. It's a major uh, port so if you can imagine a major port city like Manila, New York, uh, along that type of scale, it's very important for commerce, importing and exporting. Uh, it contained the Temple of, of Diana. So um, it contained this, this, this massive Temple of Diana. And uh, 
It had a massive theater which contain, could contain up to 50,000 spectators and had a lot of Coliseum-like events. So this is, again, you can imagine it's, it's, it's a, it's a uh, economic center. It's also a religious center. And then it's also a media center. <laughs> Today we're thinking media. That was media back then. <laughs> of communication, enjoyment like that. So um, it's, really, it's really a major center historically uh, in the, the, the ancient uh, first century. Uh, just a couple background statements concerning the background of the church itself. Um, it said there's, you know, one, one book was saying that the gospel was brought there first, right after Pentecost. And so... Um, that's possible. Uh, there's, there's also a, a strong inclination that the gospel came there through uh, Aquila and Priscilla, perhaps 52 AD. That's, that's a, a speculation. The date is not, it's not gospel, but it's a, a reasonable uh, approximation. Um, very interesting. So Paul actually remained there for more than two years. And at, we won't go there for sake of time, but in Acts 20 18 to 35 he tells them that he's leaving them uh and he tells them that he has he did not shrink back from preaching to them the whole counsel of god so imagine this this church had the apostle paul saint paul as its discipler and he and he teaches them the entire gospel the, the entire counsel of god so it's it's the fundamentally the gospel, but it's really theology. It's, it's everything that they need for, for, for life and godliness. So very powerful. This, this church is equipped. This church is gifted. It has, it has everything, okay? In that, in that uh, going away sermon, Paul also gives a moving, a, a moving speech in which he warns them of False teachers, they call them wolves. So thinking about the historical context, this is probably in the 50s AD. The, 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 the revelation of Jesus Christ that we're studying is like 90s. And so we kind of see, if you can imagine, we can kind of see historically what has happened because there is a commendation maybe, maybe related to this warning. And so maybe we'll look at that. Um, and then lastly, or, or several more things I should say, at the end of Paul's life, he, he tells Timothy to remain at Ephesus. So uh, for sure, 1 Timothy is, is written while Timothy is in Ephesus. And he also, in that, in, that, in that letter, he tells him to install godly men in leadership. And so we, 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, it's either 1 to 7 or 1 to 8. I, I didn't double check. I should have double checked that. But um, there he like warn he like tells Timothy to put godly men into leadership, and so that's actually a foundation for our biblical determine uh, for us determining godly leadership in our churches today. So so that happened in Ephesus. So very interesting. Um, and then just last the last statement is that according to apostolic tradition, the apostle the apostle John was very intimately related and connected with the, the church in Ephesus. And, and the tradition is that he also died and was buried there. So this church is, it's a gifted church. I hope you can see that. It's a gifted church. It's a prominent church. It's an equipped church. It's a church in a central location, the first century. So let me just, let's return now to our text to study. So I hope you have the background. And from there, we can discuss the, the text. Let me just share one more time here. We're working in our text. So we are going to move quickly. Last time we went through four verses. We are going to go through seven verses. I am, I am committed to this. So verse, verse number one, let's, let's, move through, uh, let's move through here. Verse number one, what is, let's think about, significances of the text itself start to make connections with 
is there any connections in in this in this part in this passage in this letter to Ephesus that's connected with the previous context? So let's let's look at those questions. Uh, action. Are there any commands, promises? Uh, is there any connection with the previous context? Is there any connection with the historical context? Any, any of those things? Go ahead. The angel of the church is a messenger. Yeah. So great. So so the let's let's make this observation from last week, right? So we have here. This is an object of the command, and so this is this. We talked about this could be an, a, an angel, literally. Or this also could be a messenger. Okay. All right. So now this is really good. So this is the, the one who is to, is, is to receive the message is this angel or messenger. And we talked about how uh, this could be the pastor, right, from last week. Now, regardless whether we identify the angel or the me or a messenger, the point of the me angel is that the angel is guarding, protecting, overseeing the church in the spiritual sense, and the message is still to get to the pastor. And the end goal of the of the the message is to go to the the church body. All right, so everyone sees that the the, the practice. Significance. Go ahead. No, I just said I see that too. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um. I'll just I'll I'll highlight something here. There's a command here. The command is to write. So this is a command. We have a big. The, there's a command here. And this is, this is like the, the third reference to writing. Okay. So, so we, we kind of overlook this, but saying something is one thing, writing something down is another thing. And so the emphasis upon the written word is really important here. The message needs to get to the church and is to be written down, okay? Now, now what, what is to be written down? What, what is to be written down? The words of him. Yeah, so, so specifically who though? So, so Frank. The word of, word of God. Okay, so this is the object. And we're identifying this as the word of God. Can we get more specific? Who, who, is the one, who is the one telling this? So look in the previous context. Who is the one telling this? Or Jesus, he, right? Yeah. And everyone sees that, right? Because what is the description of these words? What's the description of, of him? He's the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Excellent. That's what John had mentioned, right? We saw. Yeah. Number one, it's it's the one who is holding the seven stars. And then no, number two, this is number one. Number two, it's the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands, right? So this is the description of the exalt this is a description of the we've said this before risen exalted lord right this is from this is from revelation 1 9 to 20 so what i want us to see here is that there is this there is this, um, uh, um, that vision of who Jesus is, right, from the previous context, 
that should be in the primary mind as these words are written and as these words are read. Is everyone tracking with me? Everyone's tracking there with me? And there's two words, different words here. You have this holding seven stars in his right hand. And then you also have the, the walking among seven golden lampstands, which are the churches, right? So holding something, last time we talked about this, so I'm just going to review what we, did, we determined. I think Pastor Noel brought this up. This signifies, this signifies ownership. To hold something. Everyone sees that? You're holding something. You can, you can say uh, ownership, or we could at least say control, right? Ownership, or we could say Is everyone tracking with me there? The whole implication of if he's holding the seven stars in his hand, he is the one that's in control. So a very, uh, uh, a, maybe a more familiar word that we would use here, this would be a reference to the sovereignty of God. That is his control. Okay. Or we could say kingship if, if, if we want to get even more kingship. He's in control of the seven stars, which are seven angels, which are which could be seven messengers. Or 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 he is in he is an authority over the churches, okay? And in our classes we talk about in our classes we talk about God can be all powerful and God can be the Lord of the universe, but if he doesn't know what's going on in his kingdom, it doesn't mean anything, right? So the king can only act if he knows what his subjects are doing, right? So that's why both descriptions are so critical. So here we have the, the presence, the presence of the Lord. Or we can say divine presence. And I will be with you always, even to, unto the end of the age. Right? So this is the presence of the Lord. Okay? So it's like, I'm in control. Uh, write these words. Who's the, whose words are these? Literally, whose words are these? This is the one who's in control. And this is the one who sees what's going on. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> don't, be, don't be playing no games with me, okay? And the reason why this is so important is because if, if you can recall from our reading, he has, he has some commendation, but he also has, he slaps him around a bit, right? So he says, you're doing a great job here. You're lacking here. Tight, tighten the ship up, right? <laughs> let's go on here. Let's go on here. Okay, so let's move on now to... So when you say he walks among the seven lampstands, that means I'm just picturing a, like a like a maintenance guy walking along, inspecting everything if, if they're working well. Just like what I do in my job. <laughs> I do my, my boss said, do a walk at the hotel. So I'm gonna walk, you know, around the hotel and check if everything, the, the, the lightings, you know, everything, the, the toilet. It's like a doing the walk. That's how we termed it. That's how we call it in my job. <laughs> no. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. Walk the site. Pastor Rel, go ahead. Luigi. I just said walk the site. Yeah. No, that's really, that's really good. Uh, that, yeah, and that's, that's right. That's right. So if you, if you can recall last week, right, the, the initial response to the exalted risen Lord was complete terrifying fear, right? That was John's initial response. And, but, but, but Jesus is a personal, loving, intimate uh, Lord. And so he touches John and says, do not fear. 
<laughs> I'm the big dog now. <laughs> I'm the one in control. You know, don't worry. You know, um, at the same time, at the same time, we have to balance that. So Jesus is the big dog. He's on our side, but he doesn't, he's not committed to us no matter what, right? So there's still this responsibility for us to do what's right. So look here, look what we have here. What do you notice here in verse number two? What do you notice here in verse number two? What is, are, is there any action? Who is the one doing action? Is there any assessment? Is there any, you know, so the walking is the inspecting part. And so now there, there might be the, like what, what Henry's saying, I, I, not Henry, Pastor Noel. What Pastor Noel is saying is really good. He's saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm walking, I'm inspecting, I'm, I'm assessing. Is there any assessment going on in, 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 in verse two? Yeah, he, he says, he, he, I guess he, he assesses them and, and he, he knows their work. Their toil and and their patience. He he tells them he sees this. He sees what's going on. I think that shows the omniscience of Jesus. And you have this this object here. I know your works. And this is is this just. So the question I want to ask here is, is this just outward? Maybe we can't answer it yet. Or is it also inward? Sorry. Because it's one thing to inspect the outward work. It's another thing to inspect the inward. So let's think about that. Let's, let's leave this as a question. And let's see if Jesus' knowledge goes beyond the outward into the inward, okay? So then here we have... We have several, what are, what are these works? So uh, the first is the toil and, and really this patient endurance. Where have we seen patient endurance in the context? Was that in Hebrews? Uh, okay, so he, patient endurance is in Hebrews for sure. So great connection. So, but I'm thinking in chapter one. Everyone look in chapter one. Where do you see the patient endurance or some form of reference to endurance? Give me a reference. In verse nine of chapter one. Yes. Does everyone see that? The question we want to ask is just having patient endurance in our ministry, in our life, in our spiritual life, is that enough? Is that, is, that enough, is, is that all that God expects? Is that all that Jesus expects? Let's be thinking about that, okay? At least we have, they're very hardworking. They have toil, right? They're very hardworking. And they have patient endurance. So some people, this is like, this is their bread and butter. They, they are excellent at this. And so it's like, okay, they must be mature Christians, okay? So let's let's see if that's the case. Let's see what, let's see if that's the case. Okay, so, so I, I, I'm, I don't want to make an inference yet, a conclusion yet. The third thing, I'll just, this is a little complicated, so I want, I, I'll just talk through it. The third thing really here is this is a three-part activity, okay? And really, the big picture here is there's three steps here, right? Uh, step number one, they cannot bear with those who are evil, right? So this would be a reference to uh, doing church discipline, right? So they're not allowing evilness to remain in the church. And Paul talks about that in Corinthians, purging out the unleavened lump, the, the unrepentant, uh, continual, uh, knowingly continuing to sin without repentance. Um, so so they, they, what I'm trying to say is they are... Uh, attempting to purify their church biblically. This is good, okay? Step number two is not only do they have this desire, so this would be more of a desire here. This would be more of a desire. Step number two is that they've tested those who call themselves apostles. And step number three they found them to be false. 
Everyone see that there? So really here, this is, um, and, and, and apostles here, this is a, this is more of a doctrinal issue. It's not open immorality. It's not adultery. It's, it's dealing with church authority. It's in the doctrinal issues. Okay, does everyone see that here? So really, they're maintaining, uh, they are maintaining doctrinal purity. Okay? Later, we also see that they, they also hate the Nicolaitans, the Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans, however you want to say that, I, I, you know. Maybe I'm wrong there, um, but we'll talk later that it was they were sexually probably more sexually they, they were, there was a sexual immorality there. So there's also these there's also this moral moral purity that we're going to see later. Okay, what I'm trying to get at is they have the work, they have the endurance, they have the doctrinal. They got the doctrinal statement down, you know, they're, they're, they're doing that, right? Does everyone see that? Does everyone see that? You know, this is a mature church in one sense. This is a mature church. Okay. But look, it's more than that. Let's go on to verse number. This, this is number, uh, verse number three. What else can we add there? What else can we add? You have it to seems hold now he's given his feedback. Oh. You, you are enduring patiently and yeah. bearing up. Oh, no, that's good. No, that's really good. So there is some assessing here. There is some assessing. That's good. So there is some, uh, there is, now there is, this is a positive assessment, right, Frank? A positive assessment. Excellent. What is that positive assessment? And, and what is, maybe there's a relationship with verse number two. Anyone want to add? What is the positive assessment? What's the big What's the big takeaway here? That they're bearing all that for him, for Jesus. They're, they're doing that for Jesus. You're bearing up for my name's sake. So there's also a sense in which there is a, a, a focus, in a sense, on the gospel, right? The, the, the good news of who Jesus is, the good news of... No, so there's this... This would be number... This would be number four, right? They're... they're this is another knowing statement here, right? So he's knowing. What else does he know? There's another knowing statement here. And the knowing is this uh, patiently enduring, maybe three steps here. A, uh, they're patiently enduring. They're bearing for the name of, of Jesus. And they have not grown weary. So again, I want to say that this 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 could also be in connection with this is this is more maybe with the gospel. Maybe this is more of an interpretation for my part. I'm making the connection with the namesake here. They're suffering, they're suffering on behalf of the name of Christ, which the preaching of Christ is also referred to as the preaching of the gospel. So they're suffering for the sake of the gospel. Do you see how I'm roughly, in many places in Scripture, name of Christ, Christ is a reference to the gospel? Could, could it also be that they're, they're suffering out of, of people outside of the church, like trying to expand the church outside of them? Is that, this, this, this is... Well, they're experiencing maybe persecution from the outside. They're experiencing persecution from the outside, and they're, they're, they're burying it for the sake of 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 the gospel yeah is that what you're trying to say yeah no that's that's yeah, true. but i guess this but is also the fact that they they might be trying to expand the church to other people through you know and therefore bearing the other people's maybe negative thoughts about their beliefs no but that's part of it if you're being a public testimony silvio right you're looking to expand you're also receiving the pressure coming back so no, that I mean I think that's that's a good that's a good observation. 
however we see this, we have to see that it's this, this suffering, this, this some type of persecution for the sake of Christ, for the sake of the gospel, okay? And they're, they're doing it with, with uh, they're doing it faithfully, okay? So if ever, if ever you would think, wow, this is a great church. This is the kind of church we want to have, right? This is, this is the example. This, if, 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 if the passage ended here, we would say this is a model. This is a model for a church, right? Everyone sees that? This is like what we strive for. Working hard, enduring, doctrinal purity, moral purity, uh, proclaiming and maintaining the gospel, right? But it kind of goes down, it, it goes downhill from there. And it actually gets to the hard issue. It gets to the hard issue. And I want to ask the question, does all of this matter if the heart isn't in the right place? Does all of these outward works matter if the heart is not in the right place? I, I'm kind of setting you up. I'm, I'm setting us up here, okay? But I have this against you. So Jesus doesn't sugarcoat it. It's not like, you know, maybe you can improve a little bit here. Like he just is like, just hit some. Like, but I have this against you. So this is going to begin a warning, right? This is a warning here. What is the warning? Literally. So literally in the Greek. Let me just double check it here so I don't, I don't botch it. I don't botch it here. Yeah. I don't like the ESV translation. So, so Noel, you, you get a point here. What is it? No, Pastor Noel, what does NIV have? Same, but I have this against you. No, no. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My fault. How does the NIV, Pastor Noel, how do they translate this, this statement here? Okay, I'm going to read it. You have abandoned the love you had at first. Uh, it's the same. I, I don't like that. I don't like that either. I don't like that either. So NIV loses it too. ESV out. NIV out. But mine has that that you left your first love. Yes. Oh, that's good. That's good. First love. First love. Oh my goodness, that's so good. What benefit is it if you have doctrinal purity? If you have patient endurance? If you toil with all these converts in ministry, and you have a ginormous church. And you're, you know, in, in, bringing in the historical context, right? In New York City, and they're persecuting you, and you're growing, and you're standing firm, right? Ephesus was New York, right? Yeah. What is that benefit if you've left your first love? Heart, heart issue. All of that is meaningless. I have this against you. You've left your first love. What is the first commandment? Anyone? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with everything you have. And also, Tim, it's interesting when, when the Lord said, I know, in verse, in verse 2, right? I know, I know what you do. I know what you, you're good, you know. And then in verse in verse four, but I have, you no, know, you know that the I know, and then I have, meaning it's more intense. I would say yeah. I have, you know. It's against you. And, and who is this? No, that's really good. And who is this? This is the actor. This is the judge. We determined in one in one nine to twenty that 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 vision is the vision of this eschatological judge of the universe that has the keys and he has this against them all of that outward work it's not like here it's not like this okay it's not like this it's not like okay you get all these works and you've kind of left your first love but those outward works are so much stronger they are so much weightier this is no no what actually happens is the opposite all of these works mean nothing what the weight the weightier issue that the one that bangs the scale is that is that you've left the first love all these other outward works they're meaningless they're not worth a hill of beans 
and, 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 we, and, and we can say this, why can I speak so strong? Why can I speak so strong like this? You're saying, oh, well, he has it against it, but I'm sure they're still fine, right? I'm just going to highlight this. We're going to move through verse five pretty quick. There is this command here. Command to remember. Look at this. Your location. And their location is falling. Where have you fallen? And the scripture warns against falling away. So it's not like they have all these good works. They're still high up and they just got to tweak it. It's not like, oh, just, just tweak. Just tweak it a little bit. It's like, no, you've fallen. This is, this is a self-awareness. You need to be self-aware of where you have fallen. And the connection here is the therefore. Does everyone see that? It's not just like, a, okay, you just got tweaked. This is like, you've fallen. How far have you fallen? From where have you fallen? Think about that. Go ahead, Sylvia. Yeah. Could you say for... It's not as important what you do, but why you're doing it. Exactly. Absolutely correct. Absolutely excellent point. Excellent point. So, so let me just tweak it. It's, it comes back to the, it's a heart issue. Sylvia, it's a heart issue. That, I think that's what you're trying to say. In the NIV version, it says, remember then how far you have fallen. How far? How far you have fallen. I like that. And that's the sense. That's the sense. I like that translation. So the NIV is, is one up on ESV. I like that. That is really good. How far you have fallen. So it, it seems like they have done a lot. You know, they, they, they really have, when, when it comes to accomplishing verse two and three, they have really been through a lot and they, they're really good. And then when it comes to verse four and five, while they were doing that, they, they have really fallen really far already. They didn't have self-care for their heart. They didn't guard their heart. I was wondering, did they know, did they, did they know it or... This is why I remember, or they did know. I, this is an issue where I think that they're self-deceived. They thought they did not guard their heart. They focused on the ministry. Remember this? Pastor Noel said this to me. I will never forget it. I will forever mention this to all our students. This is so profound. We were talking about the fruits of the Spirit, and we're going through the fruits of the Spirit. And past, we, we mentioned faithfulness. And Pastor Rowe told me this. He said, faithfulness to the ministry is not necessarily faithfulness to God. I will never forget that. I will never, ever forget that. And we can be so faithful to the ministry and not actually faithful to God. They did not guard their heart in ministry, and they had a wrong focus. They were ministry-driven, not God-driven, not love-for-God-driven. And it's easy to fall into the trap that because you're busy you're doing a lot of things, you know, it's easy to fall in the trap that you thought you are really pleasing God, but really God looks in our hearts, not on what we do, you know? Yeah. First step. <laughs> First step. And this is what pastors say. They're not self-aware. They're not self-aware right now. First step is to remember. And then the second step is to repent. That is to turn. And then the third step is to do the work she did first. So it's like, but they're doing all these works. You, this is what Silvio is talking about, the why. Do it again, but with the right heart. <laughs> See that? 
looks like they re they reverse the process. Yeah. You know, they, they. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, what I'm saying, they have reverse the price. You should, you should love and then do the, the things instead of doing the things and then love. It kind of like it's like what drives the, the first is the love. Yeah. You know, those works. That's that is that is the that is the the framework that Pastor Morell is sharing. Love and faith. Because really, love is also faith. It's dependence. It's, it's all. It's all the same. It's. It's. I mean, it's all interconnected and, and inseparable. If you're loving, if you're truly loving Jesus, if you're truly, truly loving God, the dependence is there. So you can't. You can't separate love and faith. You know, they're inseparable. They're inseparable. But look at this. Look at this. So there's a three-step process. And then look at this. This is. This is a a, a warning here. This is a warning. Look at this condition. Condition. If not, I will come. The coming of the Lord. I will come. Action. Action. One action, two. I will remove your lampstand. What do you think this means? I will remove your lampstand. Let me ask a question. Is, is the church of Ephesus present today? No. No. Is, is, it, is the light of the church of Ephesus present today? Did you say the light? Yeah, the lampstand, so the lampstand signifies the church, and that the, the light actually also signifies, you know, the, the, the light that it represents. So it's, it's a, maybe we could say figuratively the gospel witness, the, the, wisdom, the witness in the world, in the dark world. Um, but the question is, is that, now, I don't want to talk about reasons for the church ending, but what I want us to see here is that this is a warning that, that Jesus, if the church doesn't repent, if it doesn't get it right, he will, he will take away the church. He will end the church's impact. Does everyone see that? I'm. He's going to remove the church. If we're following the imagery, I will remove your church. Well, he, he yeah, he, he he judges and takes. He ends the, the the church ceases to exist, and we see that we see churches mm. cease to exist, right? Yeah. So Tim, you're saying it's literal, it's not figure of speech, it's like a literal, he will remove the lampstand, meaning basically he will remove the church. Yeah, I think so or so the, the figurative is the figurative is the lampstand. What is the lampstand signified? The church. So reading it, reading it, you know, in context, it would be I will come and I will remove your church. Your gospel, maybe you want to say gospel witness, maybe you want to see the church's presence, but the church will be brought to its end, to, to, to the end. I'll remove it from its place. I, I think that's the most, if we're reading it carefully, we're, 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 at, we're looking at the images, we're looking at the images. Um, and then the, the, the wording here is, unless you repent. So again, this is a, this is a, re, a repeat, right? So it's not too late. It's not at this point. There's an assessment. An assessment here. It's not too late, and they can change. This is only a warning. This is only a warning. Okay, is everyone tracking there with me? Maybe maybe you want to disagree, and and if you disagree, that you know this is strong. This is strong. Um, I think it's 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 a fair interpretation with what's what's what with what's happening here. Um, and it's a it's it's a fair interpretation, I think, because at the end of the day, they they um, this is not individually going to hell, okay? So we should not interpret this as God is sending the church members to hell. Now, perhaps some some in the church may have been unbelievers, and, and they would of course later be judged and 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 go to hell. But this is this is a this is a, a corporate warning 
and a corporate judgment. And it's, 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 it, I would say that it's not yet eschatological. So the, the, the view here is not eschatological, meaning he's not referring here to eternal judgment. He's referring, he's referring, referring here to stewardship. So let's, let's, let's put some things down here. This is referring to um, stewardship. And it's really happening even in our time, you know, the churches who, or the pastor or the church who has destroyed their reputation and their, their testimony, they are destroyed. They are, they don't exist. They stop in existence, right? It's happening yeah. now. No, no, you're absolutely right. And there are churches, there are churches, I'm thinking, I will not mention names because we'll post this later on YouTube, but there's a church I'm thinking about. It's a big, it's a massive church. It was a massive church, massive church known around the world. You know, um, the pastor was caught in sin. He was unrepentant for the most part. Eventually he was forced to resign and the church dissolved. The church dissolved. Those members, there was probably many believing in the church. There was probably many believing in the leadership, but because they did not repent corporately, and, and it began at the top in the church, the church was dissolved, and many of those members went to other churches. So, yeah, I want to be clear. This is not a reference to eschatological judgment. This is a reference to a judgment of a church, and no doubt there is judgment of individuals in the church. So, so that, doesn't, that doesn't remove if, 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 a, if an individual has great sin, he's unrepentant. It has, it's not focused on that. It's focused on the church as a corporate um, as a, as a corporate entity be, being a light witness for God. And, and I think Pastor, Pastor Noel is point spot on that there are many churches, we see it happening today. So this is not, this should, we should focus on this as being a warning, something that we, we, we reflect upon. Our, does this apply to us? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but we should at least consider that. It should be a consideration and we need to make the adjustments, okay? So I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers at ICF. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying like as individuals and as a church body, we should always be self-aware. We should always have a time of, of introspection and reflection. Um, where are we as a church? You know, do we have something we need to adjust on? Again, I'm not, I'm not even thinking anything specific. I'm just speaking in general terms, okay? Please don't misunderstand me yet. And this is also like a picture of, a, of like a church discipline, you know. Yeah. If there, it's very clear in the book of Matthew, you know, if there's someone who commits sin, you can confront them. If they don't repent, you know, yeah. excommunicate them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> treat, treat them like as a Gentile or uh, an unbelieving, an unbeliever, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's very heavy, but that's what the word of God says. Yeah, yeah. And, and Pastor Nervo, about all of us have been there and experienced that type of, 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 of calling as a pastor. It's very hard if you, it, you know, there's, there's tears involved. I've cried in the past over situations like that. I, I'm sure that, that you have. It's not easy, but it's necessary. It's a requirement. And here we need to see first and most importantly, it's, it's important to us because it's important to Jesus. These are the words, Amen. and and if someone says these are hard words, Tim, okay, that's the I I I'm just the messenger. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger. Oh my goodness. <sighs> I mean, that's I guess what the word of God says so. I mean, the way to look that, at it, I think, is that you know it's a compassionate act because if someone's on the wrong path, yeah. you're trying to steer them onto the right path. If you don't correct them they're gonna they're gonna stay on the wrong path so it's actually a, right. a compassionate thing to do no that's right we can see here that the uh that the 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 purpose of the uh of verse verse uh, five Go is ahead. really restoration not not you know it's restoration not uh not condemnation oh, so good yes Yes, yes. The purpose here is, this is, oh, I did not even think about that for a minute. No, that is really good, Pastor. You get the gold star. That is so good. Oh, my goodness. So here, the goal here is restoration. 
not condemnation. If there's genuine repentance, genuine repentance, there's, there can be restoration. Absolutely. But it must be, uh, this must be genuine restoration. Uh, genuine, genuine, uh, genuine, con- uh, genuine repentance must be pre- present. Really excellent. Maybe you should, def- you should define what is repentance. It's what's the difference between confession and repentance. Yeah. So, yeah, so let's talk about repentance. Again, it's from the heart, right? Yeah. Uh, let, let me, let me, I will give, I will give the best example. I will share, let's, let's, let's look at the best example of genuine, of genuine, genuine repentance. Okay, the best example here. If you have your Bibles, turn in, turn, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. You, you know where I'm going. I'm going to the, the prodigal son, but um, I want to just highlight several things. So I'm really glad that you brought that up, Pastor. This is the, this is the, this is the quintessential example of what genuine repentance looks like and, and some fruits of repentance. Genuine, okay? Look at this. But when he came to himself, he, the prodigal son, says, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish in hunger? I will rise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am not worthy to be called your son. Treat me as your hired servant. So this is, this is an, an explicit confession. Without excuse or pride. This is a humble state. I am not worthy. No excuse. I am not worthy. Treat me as a hired servant. Treat me as just a peasant as one of your tenants. And he arose and came to the father, but while it was still a long way off, his father uh, fell on him. He embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, so that's what he thought. Okay, that's what he said to himself. And the son said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am not worthy to be called your son. Anyone who is caught in a sin, but is still trying to hold on to things, trying to justify, trying to, you know, or wasn't that bad or, you know, I kind of messed up. That they are not exhibiting genuine repentance or the fruits of genuine repentance. I am not worthy to be called a son. He's giving up his sonship. It recognizes in his mind the severity of the sin. And so when we see this, we know what genuine repentance looks like. There's confession, and that, so there's, there's a genuine turning, there's genuine confession of the wrongdoing. And then there's this state of humility and a completely change of mind. So when you see someone that's, that's engaged in behavior, they're caught, but there's no change of mind. There's no state of humility. Cigarado, they don't have true repentance. They're just saying it. They're saying what they need to say to escape the punishment. Excellent. Thank you, Pastor. So good. So good. All right, let's. I want to get. We're we're late. I want to. I want. I want to finish up here. Um, so I'll just quickly summarize, and we'll be done here. Uh, there is this reference to. There's another commendation here. We don't have time to discuss this. My, at least at this point, my reference, my my uh, understanding here. Maybe actually, I think that the Nicolaitans is brought up once again later. And so we can talk about that. This is probably concerning like um, lawlessness. They engaged in um, lawlessness or um, like hyper grace type activity. 
where they're engaging in like a Gnostic, oh, you know, there's no sin, you can do whatever, you, you know, you're free. We can talk about that later. I think that's what was going on. And so this is really a, 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 a false doctrine that Paul was against, that Peter was against, that James was against. And, and um, um, yeah, so that, that's kind of, so this is like, Jesus is really giving an honest assessment. He's, he's, he's being very positive, but he's being honest in the critique. So he's giving a really good, honest, true assessment. And then he gives, he gives this conclusion. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So this is a call. Blessed are the ones who, who, who read aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are the ones who hear and obey. So this is a call to, to hear and obey from Rev 1, 3, to the one who conquers. Where have we heard this conquer language before? This is so good. Conquer sounds like what? What type of language is this? If you're conquering, you're what? It's like a victor in a battle. Beating. Yeah, so this is a <laughs> battle, and this is this is this is really referencing to kingdom language. John, your your brother and and partner in kingdom, tribulation, and patient endurance. So this is going right back to, to Revelation, Revelation uh, 1, 9. We have the patient endurance. We have the, the suffering. And now there's a call to, to conquer in the kingdom sense. Okay, but this is, you can see here, the conquering is in a spiritual, in a spiritual sense that's focused on obeying God's commands. And this is heart, at the heart and the outward. So we can talk about uh, perseverance, the call to persevere. And the reward is what? What is the, what is the reward here? So good. Heaven. Yeah. This is eternal life. So the first time I heard about the tree of life is in Genesis, and now it, it was brought back in the Revelation. Yeah. So this is where Genesis... If it's so, this goes. This is apologetics. This <laughs> Genesis is just myth. It's not real. Oh, that sucks for us. <laughs> oh, it's just it's it's not real. It's just the moral of the story, you know. And it's kind of like, yeah, this is like this is no, this is this is not right. This is not right. Because in Genesis. God forbid anyone to eat from the from the tree of life, right? Yeah. You know, that's why he uh, he has driven Adam and Eve away from from the from the garden uh, from the gar from eat from the garden, and then now Jesus said, "I will allow him to eat <laughs> yeah. from the tree of life," and it's physical. It's physical. This is physical. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's, it's physical. Let, let me read one more passage here and we'll be done. One more passage here. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit. Yielding fruit in each month. 
No longer will there be anything accursed. It was a healing for the nations. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. It's real. It's not, it's not fake. And it's our call. It's our call. What I want to say here is that the, in close here, the point and the warning for us, for us each to inspect our life individually and also as a church at some, at, at, throughout our, our life and throughout the life of the church is that it doesn't matter how big a ministry, it doesn't how, matter how small the ministry, it doesn't matter how much works we do outwardly, it doesn't matter how much persecution we suffer. If we do not have a love, if we do not have a love and um, a commitment to Jesus Christ and God first, it's all meaningless. And our job is to assess, is what, what Jesus with the Spirit is saying to me, to saying to you is, you assess where you're at. And if there's a problem, remember, <laughs> repent and do. Remember, repent, and do. And the goal is not condemnation. The goal is restoration. The goal is restoration. And so, um, and then this is the promise to the one who conquers. To the one who conquers, I will give of the fruit of the tree of life that is in the paradise of God.